we're glad y'all are with us this morning. We're going to jump in. We're going to have a lot of fun this morning. I've been getting a lot of requests to teach the book of Revelation, so I'm not. <laughs> but I'm going to teach a little dab today for us men, things that I think we need to hear, things as we roll into the new year, a way to pray for the church, a way to pay attention to the church, a way to say, hey, what can I do as a member of the church of the Lord? And, and this is the church is what set up on upon the earth in order to take the gospel throughout the world. A church is a place where relationships come together. You know, we had the opportunity to explain to our girls this week and and the nieces this week, and there's only one nephew, and that's Wade. But the, during Thanksgiving week, you know, we took some time out just simply say, without the church, we wouldn't be together. I mean, the church is responsible for our family. That's where Allison and I met was the church. That's where... Um, uh, being Wink, of course, for years and years and years, attended church and uh, came together really through the church. And um, it's it's really how, in many ways, that I knew Miles outside of the church, but uh, through an invitation of coming to Cowboy Church, he's a brother-in-law. So the church is one of the institutions that God placed in the world, if and it's the main institution because it's his bride, and he's extremely concerned about his bride. So I think we as men, as we look into the year of 2023, you believe that? It's right around the corner. As we look into that, we need to be asking ourselves and praying over some questions. What does God require of me in the year of 2023? What does God require of me in the church as a man of God? So we're going to talk about those things this morning. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and we'll jump right in. Dear Jesus, I thank you for this time. I thank you for who you are. I thank you, Father, for being Lord. I thank you that before the creation of this world. Father, your word reminds us that uh, you knew us, you saw us. Father, we are your most beloved creation. Father, help us to see who we are in you and through you. And Father, help us to see you for who you are as Lord of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Coming to you from Revelation chapter 2 to the angel of church in Ephesus, right? Now, there's some important things to know about the church at Ephesus. It has some very important pastors that passed through by this time. And so when I jump in, um, there, this, this letter that John is writing that he's seen and he's foreseen through the power of the Holy Spirit is a very, very important letter. And he says, to the angel of the church at Ephesus write, this is Revelation 2.1, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds, your tool, your perseverance. You cannot tolerate evil men. You put to test those who call themselves apostles. And they are not, and you found them to be false, and you have persevered and endured for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember the height in which you have fallen. Repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and remove your lamp, stand out of its place, unless you repent. Now, let me stop right here and just say, a lampstand is a church. All right, he's writing to the church at Ephesus. A lampstand produces what? Come on, man, wake up this morning. It produces light. It's not difficult stuff to read. This is very easy material to preach and to teach. Yet you have this, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life and in the paradise by, in the paradise of God. That's where we want to be. That's where eternity is. That, in many ways, goes back to Genesis, right? That's almost like the Garden of Eden. I mean, you see paradise right here, and he says, hey, is as long as you do the things of me in the way that I have called you to do them, this is where we wind up. So when we look at this, man, a couple of things that I just want to explain before uh, we jump in to the meat of the message. One is the Nicolaitans. There are many commentarians who say, hey, what is a Nicolaitan? And they try to uh, use all kinds of different responses and different definitions based upon the history and historical data of the church, and that's great. It's really easier for me to understand one thing. The Nicolaitans were a ruling class, and if you don't remember anything else, that's kind of what it was. And, and ruling classes have a tendency to be set up even within the church. You ever notice that? You got bishop so-and-so. You got elder so-and-so. You got you know, it just goes on pastor so-and-so. And it's not wrong to uphold with double honor. That's what the apostle Paul tells Timothy. Hey, you, you need to honor these men. But the men to take that honor to a level of a ruling class becomes dangerous because Jesus said the greatest among you will be what? The servant of all. Now, if you want all that broken down, nikao, laetin, um, those two words are really combined there. Nikao means ruler of in the Greek. 
And this is where a lot of people won't go with this definition simply because of this. Laity comes from the Latin word, or laetin comes from the Latin word laity. So it's not necessarily a Grecian word. It would be a Latin word. But when the two come together, that's what that means. And that's the way I, I tend to uh, believe in all my studies what it means is really a ruler of the laity. So what he's saying is, he says, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. In other words, they're doing some deeds in front of you to be seen by men. Jesus gives a warning about this in the Pharisees. You remember the Pharisaical ring? They, they love to do their prayers on the street corners, right? They, lead to fa- they love to fast and, and love for people to know that they're fasting. He gives a warning. And in some ways, that ruling class had already been set up. All right, hopefully we've, we've put that to plunder now. So here's what we need to know, men. There's no doubt that as, as he writes to these churches, that what he's doing is he's saying the church is the hope for the world. The church is the very bride of Christ, but it comes with a warning and that we are not to lose hope. So by the time we get to verse seven, we have something, that, something said to us. He says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat to the tree of life, which is in the paradise of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You see, this is where the church has to take a stand because we must must be those who overcome, not those who condone. Men, it is time for us to be willing to stand up for our faith. The church is not gaining ground in America. It is gaining ground throughout the world. But in America, we've got to start asking our que- ourselves a question. What is wrong? What do you see wrong? What do I see wrong? Well, if sin, this is one of the things I've noticed that many churches are starting to condone sin. And look, if you condone sin, there is nothing to overcome. In other words, this is what we say. And I, I just had, we just did Hebrews 6. I was telling Joshua this yesterday. It's a t- difficult lesson for my kids yesterday because we just did Hebrews 6. You want something to wrestle with, go wrestle with that one. Because outside of Christ, there is no hope. And so the challenge is for us not to become works righteous, to stay in faith righteous, but understand that faith righteous produces works. Maybe I should say it this way. Men, we do what we believe. That's the way it works. So when you look at this scripture, we're in this thing that, that simply says um, that we have to overcome in this life. I mean, he talks about overcoming even, even beyond this. Y'all know another scripture in the book of Revelation where there is a promise given to those who overcome? Anyone? Is anyone still awake? All right, because the promise is, uh, 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 how do we overcome? He says it right here in the book of Revelation. What does he say? Through the word of their testimony and what? Hey, the blood of the lamb, all right? And so that means that we're taking a stand because we understand that we're bought with a price. And so here's what we see. We must be overcomers. And that is not necessarily a condoner. As a matter of fact, it has nothing to do with condoning sin. But we live in a world today that looks for sin to be condoned. And this is why Jesus didn't die to condone sin, but that we would overcome sin through his power. Men, listen to me. This is very important because God has given us the power to overcome sin. That's why he doesn't tolerate it. That's why in Joshua's message on Sunday, he talked about uh, you want your heart to be hardened, continue in that same sin because eventually our heart becomes hardened because we are the ones that choose to distance ourselves from God, not that he's distanced himself from us. Hebrews says it's impossible to repent and come back. Chapter six. Yeah, that's a tough one. Now, listen, he's talking to the Hebrews. All right, I had to take my children back and say, wait a minute, let me tell you why it was impossible because there was some some deeds, there was some works righteousness that they were trying to draw the church back into saying this is the way because Jesus was after all a Jew. So some churches have turned no doubt to false prophets and and they're looking to condone this sin because my pastor said it was okay. I was at a meeting just here the other day where a person stood up and said, hey, um, you are welcome at our church because simply... Uh, you are ignorant if you are one of those pastors or if you follow one of those pastors who still believes in sin. So listen, this prevents the power of God in people's lives to overcome sin. And the promise is always to overcomers, men. The promise aren't to condoners. The promise aren't saying, God, you're wrong today. God, you should have changed with us because obviously your people are changing. You should just change with us. No, God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So there's four things in here that I want to talk about this morning, and we're going to move quickly because 
the church at Ephesus I could talk about for a long time. I have studied this church inward, outwardly, uh, every way you possibly could. The church at Ephesus made a big, big uh, mark upon its area, its territory for years and years and years to come. The church at Ephesus, an incredible church. However, it should have been incredible. Look at the preachers that this church had. The apostle Paul taught in the synagogue there. All right, the, the pot didn't teach. I'm sure it tried to show up, all right? But the apostle Paul taught in the synagogue there. John the Baptist, he, he actually uh, was very interested in this church, and for, for a good while, John wound up sending different ones that he had taught to this church. And then there was Timothy, and Timothy would be the senior pastor at this church for years, and Timothy was an understudy of who? Paul. There you are. So this church should have been a dynamic uh, uh, incredible church where it was serving, serving, and from the outside in, this church had it going on, and uh, and so the uh, John sees some things in here. The angel shows John that their deeds. He said, "I want to talk to you about your deeds. Let's talk about what this looks like." He says, "I know your deeds." Now, this is important for every church man, and every church needs to uphold the deeds of the church. So if I were to ask you today, what are the deeds of the church? It's important that you know the deeds of the church. So I like to say it this way. As a matter of fact, I was thinking of this um, last week. I'm about to take everything off my walls in my office, and I, I'm, I'm going to ask Darla or someone to, to make me uh, the mission statement, the values. I want to just decorate my office room where every day I'm looking at the, this is what we do. We don't go outside of this. This is who we are. This is what we stand for. This is the direction we're going, and nothing out there is going to get our attention. I don't need all my, my stuff and all my heroics up on my wall about me. Uh, there's very few anyway. I think there's three. Anyway, it's not about me. It's about Jesus, it's about his mission statement. So when he says, I know your deeds, I know what your mission statement was, man. I know what you were called to do in this area. You had a plan. I had a plan. This is Jesus speaking. I had a plan, a purpose for you. And, and you've walked away from it. In other words, this is what makes us different. This is what I've called this specific church in this specific area to do. But the men have to be willing to do it. And so this is what we live out in front of others. It's no doubt it's hospitality, it's prayer, it's love, it's holding everyone in a valuable way, it's healthy relationships. But those are values here at Harvest Connection. That's who we are. But we have summarized those values in these four things, the Word of God, prayer and worship, healthy relationships, and giving. That's who we are. We give immensely in this church. Now, that I'm not talking about just financially. I'm talking about in, in everything and all things that we are called to do. The Word of God takes precedence. We would not have a plumb line if we did not have the Word of God, if we didn't have God's Word. So we see it as truth. We see it as the most valuable thing that He's left with us next to Jesus. All right? And then prayer and worship. Of course, we pray and we worship the one who has created us, who's created this world, and, of course, relationships uh, connecting upward, connecting inward, and connecting outward. That's, that's who we're about. So these are our difference makers, and this is what Jesus is saying. I know your deeds. Your deeds are very important, men. What God has called you to do, what he's called you to be and become in this world, he is after you, and he's after the mission that he's placed in your life. For some of you, you travel. Jens is traveling around the world. Michael travels around the world. Those are, those are their deeds, their, their values. It's where they're called to. It's what they're called to do. And when we get to toil, that's the next thing he speaks of. Let's look at toil. Toil is similar to work, but watch, it's hard work. Toil's tough. When you look at toil in the Old Testament, I mean, sometimes it's compared to a goad, like you're kicking, you're kicking the goads, right? That's even in the New Testament there. Toil is, is tough work. It's churning things up. Now, we are not saved through works nor deeds. However, all of us will do what we believe. You'll take a stand for what you believe in the most. All of us, this is who we're called to be as men. James says that this means show your faith apart. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Our salvation is through our faith, our belief, but we do what we believe. This church has great deeds ahead of it. But it's going to be the men that are upholding these deeds, that are making sure that we uphold what God has called us to in these deeds. And it happens many times through our toil. People will see our toil. And, and many times, 
People praise us for our toil. Hudson Taylor once said this. He said, I used to ask God to help me. Then I prayed if I might help him do his work through me. Isn't that interesting? I used to ask God to help me. Then I asked him to help me do or help him do his work through me. St. Augustine stated it this way. He said, pray as though everything depended upon you. Work as though everything depended upon you. So he said, pray and work as though it all depends upon you. And, and this can be a little bit dangerous because uh, many of us do this. If it's going to be done and done right, then I've got to do it. Isn't it good that Jesus didn't say that? that that's what you said. But, but Jesus didn't say that. As a matter of fact, Jesus called a knucklehead. Now, I have to be careful because one day, he, okay, I didn't say knucklehead. <laughs> Peter, forgive me. Right, But I was going to say, Jesus called Peter, knowing that one day he's going to have to call him Satan. Get thee behind me, say Matthew chapter 16, right? Jesus called the three that, that walked closest to him. They got to go to the Mount of Transfiguration with him. But at the whole time, what's he doing? He's equipping them for ministry. And they're going to mess up, and they're going to stumble, and they're going to fumble, and there's going to be things that happen, but it didn't change the call on their life, nor did it change the work that he had prepared beforehand to do, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Men, it's, it's okay to grasp what God is calling to. And, and it's okay to have this thought, pray as though everything depended on you, work as though everything depended on you. It's okay to have that thought. It's not that St. Augustine was wrong, but we need to equip others to have that same passion and that same integrity in the works that are placed before them. So what do we do? We equip the saints for service. We, and that service, equipping the saints for service, is toil. How you serve, what you serve, um, it doesn't matter who leaves this area, who leaves this place to go do something else. Hopefully they carry the values of the church that supports them and prays for them as well. Now, make no mistake, this church is hard at work. And we have many of you men who showed up a couple of weeks ago and helped move the prayers. Thank y'all for that. That's uh, per city code. Okay, let's keep going. Let's not spend too much time on that, Curtis. All right, we want friends with the city. All right. But make no mistake, this church does work. Now, as we look at the church at, at Ephesus, it looks like there's no performers there, no low performers there. In this church, it takes about 90 to 120 volunteers. Now, I love this because the first phone call I got after Sunday, I wasn't here on Sunday. Some of you don't even know that because you weren't either. But anyway, uh, uh, Sunday, I, the first call I get is uh, about an elder that is serving in the Kid City area. We had a little difficulty, not with the elder, but with a child. Now, I want to tell you, my first response was, praise God. That's a good problem to have. I got an elder in there that's already dealing with it. So I'm already put at ease, right? And so, men, this is, this is a, a beautiful thing when men stand up and really do serve and toil for where God has called them to be. Some tarry in the prayer room. Others toil cleaning the kitchen and in the bathroom. Some are studying and preparing to teach. Others of you are opening your homes. There's no doubt. Some of you are feeding the homeless. But here's the truth. We, we don't want to become territorial over our ministries. Sometimes people have started and created a ministry and we become very territorial over them. Here's the thing. When we toil, when we labor, when we put forth effort, we naturally become territorial. And guys, this is where church many times get in trouble. Because we don't add to our teams. We don't grow our teams. Or we let the women do it. You ever been that one? Women will toil. They will. I mean, when I left the house this morning, <clears throat> Allison's already got 30 minutes on the treadmill. Just treading it out. You know, I'm like, you get it, girl. And then go and come here to toil, right? But, but here's the truth. Women will do it. <clears throat> but it's our call, men to lead by example. And as our ministries grow, the level of help must grow. There's no doubt we're looking at, at moving over to a new building soon. So we've got to learn what it means to, to grow our areas, engage them, equip them, empower them, because after all, the ministry belongs to the Lord. This is who God has called us to be, men uh, who are willing to tool for the sake of the gospel where he's called us. All right, the third thing I see in here is perseverance. 
Perseverance is, is always going to be important. The book of Revelation pays a lot of attention to perseverance, to the saints who persevere, to those who persevere, to he who persevered, to he who overcomes. You just read it time and time and time again. Now, I'm preparing to teach the book of Revelation, just so you know. But I also want you to know that um, prior to doing this, we've just got to lay some groundwork. Perseverance becomes very important because we hear this all the time, and I don't know that we believe it. The perseverance of who? The saints. The perseverance of who? Well, I thought the church was going to be raptured out after Revelation chapter 4. You better stay with me. We, we, we might want to learn some. Look, it's very important in the Christian walk to know what it means to persevere. The promise goes to the perseverance of the saints. The old saying is right. Either you are going into a storm in the midst of a storm or coming out of one, but you must persevere regardless of the storm. It's not getting burned by the fires of life, but being refined by the fires of life. For some of us, uh, there's no doubt that if you go back 10 and a half years ago, we were in a house together. And, and, and that was a great time. Others of you came aboard when we were at the country barn. Others along, uh, came along at I-27. We're in a 3,000 square foot building. And some of us uh, gave our last savings for the building that we're currently in. And some of us have given up maybe our life savings for the next building. <laughs> no doubt it takes sacrifice. It takes perseverance to see the church grow. But this is not ours. This belongs to Jesus. And there is nothing that we give that is ever wasted. Matter of fact, anything that's given to Christ is 30, 60, 100 and fold, 100 fold. That's what he does with it because it belongs to him because our God is always a God who is a builder. That's who he is. He builds his kingdom. So, no doubt ups and downs. Ups and downs simply means in life that you're going to have to persevere through some things. And if we can continue on in the vision, look, there's no doubt that God is going to continue to move us on, men, but we've got to be men who persevere for his name's sake. Notice it says, you have persevered and endured for my name's sake. So Jesus is saying, what's a namesake? You ever think of what a namesake is, men? This is very important for us to know. He says, you've done this for my name's sake. And so uh, let's think for just a moment, moment what a namesake is. Just want to take a moment here to do just a minute of teaching. You're going to love this. Uh, my namesake, uh, when, when, when Alice and I got married 25 years ago, she did what? She changed her last name. Do you know why scripturally that's supposed to happen? Any of you know? To become one. We don't need a double-headed monster out there. The two become one. And what are the two called to do? Go back to the garden. Be fruitful and multiply. Because the next generation is who? Our namesake. Your namesake is the generation that you left behind. So he said, here's what I'm doing for all of you. I, I, I have created through my bride in the church to carry on what? My namesake generation to generation. And so what he's saying is this thing is generational, that, that the church is called to be generational. And, and it's his name that is meant to be promoted throughout the world, through generations, generation after generation. You know, uh, just recently, Emma has been um, cheering volleyball games. Now, I, I got I to gotta admit, I'm not a, okay, I like volleyball. I have to be careful. But um, anyway, at the beginning of the season, I don't know why, but they, you know, you got to buy these shirts. And, and so she, she buys the shirt, and then our whole family has to have the shirt. But the cool thing about, about these shirts is they say house going this way down the back. So like H and then straight down the back, and they're black. And they're really cool. And I was sitting in the gym the other day, and my family was there, and they all had their house shirts on because Emma was cheering, and, and it said house down. And I was like, oh, man, that's my namesake. That's cool to see, right? It's a witness. It's a witness of your vision, of your values, of who you are, what you stand for. That's what a namesake is. And that's the beautiful thing about um, the perseverance of the saints because we carry on for his namesake because we are his generation from generation to generation. We are the bride of Christ. And then four, healthy relationships. And this is the final thing I have for us, man. Healthy relationships is found at the church of Ephesus. See, uh, this is what he said. I, uh, I, he says uh, they, they've kept the main thing, the main thing. All right, been doing good. And then 
uh, they become disconnected. They're connected with one another, but they've been connect- disconnected from one healthy relationship that we can never be disconnected from. Verse four, but I have this against you that you have left your first love. I love the way he says this because this is how we know this is the word of God. Most of us talk about losing our first love or losing our love or losing the love of our life or whatever it was that you lost, all right? But that's not what he says. He says, you left it. You didn't lose it. Jesus didn't lost somewhere. He didn't go somewhere. He said, you simply left your first love. And so they got so busy doing that they missed the why behind the what. Do you ever do that? We do it all the time. How many times do you leave the house and say, oh, I forgot. And you go back in and then you go, what did I come back in for? As I get older, I'm doing this all the time. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to go out in the shop and get, and I get in the shop and go, what? See, what happens, sometimes that's how easy it can be. We, we, we miss the why behind the what. And we have to remember why, what we do and the reason why we do what we do. Our relationship with Jesus cannot be substituted through works or anything else. And I, I had this conversation with the girls yesterday morning. I said, girls, this is the problem with Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 is really, I mean, this looks, I mean, they were devastated when they read Hebrews 6 yesterday, and I finally had to just pull it all out and say, well, here's the problem. You think that you can't repent. Yes, you can. I mean, you can. Let's just flip over and see where that happens in the book of Revelation, even for the church. And so our relationship with Jesus can never be substituted through works or anything else. When you leave your love, there is the potential to lose your relationship. And Jesus does not want that to happen. When you leave Jesus, when you are so self-centered instead of Christ-centered, there is no doubt that your relationship will suffer. And this is where statements like, I don't need the church to get to heaven. Me and God got it all figured out. I don't need you. I don't need a building. I don't need to be preached to. And the list goes on and on. Guys, I hear it almost every week. I'll probably hear it today somewhere. You know, I don't need that. I don't need you. I don't need this. I don't have, why should I listen to you? All the churches are the same. No, no, this church was called for a specific reason. If all the churches were the same, there wouldn't be seven churches here in the book of Revelation that we're speaking to. There would be one church that he's talking to. Now there is one bride, but there's no doubt the bride is called for the cultures that they serve. Not to change, but to change the cultures or bring the cultures into God's kingdom. So let's keep moving. This is why we don't only do church on Sundays, but everything we do, men, and everything that we uphold should be to set up his kingdom here on this earth. This is why when we minister to our kids, it's so important that they understand the importance of staying connected in a healthy body and bride of Christ. It's important that um, our kids understand to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. because this is what God requires of us. And it starts with our relationship with God, with Jesus himself, men. Verse six, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Well, I've explained to you who those are. Those are the ruling class, those who want to rule over others. It, It shouldn't be that way. We're all in this together. We all have a plan and a purpose that was given to us by God for God's kingdom, not for ours. It's not for our praise. It's not for our value. He's already upheld us in his value. It's for his, right? He laid his life down for our value. And we should love him for that and for that alone. So that relationship should never be broken, men. So men, it would be a terrible thing. Notice notice where he leaves this church, that there is a risk in the lampstand being taken away when we don't uphold the things that he's called us to do and to be for the communities that we serve. When we serve one another, we serve our families, we serve our church, we serve our communities, and we serve the world in order to bring the world to Jesus through his church.